Some of you. Yeah, you know, if you're just finishing. Okay, I will. Because Alexi and Chris will also be showing some photographs. Okay. Um, well, um, well, John was asking me to give my opinion as a Turkish person why Alaguilar is so important. Um, of course, there is so much to say, but personally, I may say that um, Ara and his photography represents my childhood. Um, I was raised in Istanbul and I was away of the city for a while and then I came back to live again and um, as with maybe every other city around the world, the city has grown and it has changed so much and when I look at the photography, um, that's my childhood there with the, with the sense, with the sounds, with the scenery and it means so much to me and I'm, I'm sure all of you would agree to this. It's nothing personal, but it's something that we share in common when we when we look at Ara's photography. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, thank thank you so well, much. I, actually, just a, kind of an added comment on on, on what you said uh, in terms of your own childhood and how his photographs represent so much of the city in that period from the fifties up through the eighties when the city was in such transition, it reminded me, I actually did want to mention this, you know, the great Turkish Nobel laureate from like 2007 or 2008, Orhan Pamuk, uh, wrote a memoir of his own childhood growing up in the 50s and 60s, when uh, Istanbul was still a city from one, one and a half million to two million, up to more than 15 million today. And the photographs that Alexi and Chris are going to show us represent what the city looked like in that point. And, and it was also, you know, it was Oren Pamuk's childhood. And this book, um, you can get just the text, but there's what's called an expanded edition. It's available in paperback. Uh, it's called Istanbul. It's a memoir by Orhan Pamuk. And it has over 200 photographs, maybe 250 photographs, uh, along with the text. And I'd say three quarters of them are his photographs and to, to see the photographs that he took in the period when Orhan is talking about the transformation in the city and growing up in the city uh, into his teen years, it's, it's really extraordinary. Thank you very much. John. Thank you very much. May I conclude by thanking the wonderful team of Ms. Artekin um, herself and her team. They've been, um, they made these, the, this tour possible. Thank you. So uh, next up, uh, uh, we'd like to have Alexi uh, talk to us as a fellow photographer, as a fellow street photographer who has looked at people and light and texture, uh, much as Arla did, uh, but in a very different style and uh, at a slightly different time. So please, uh, uh, Alexi, go ahead. Yes, I, um, I want to of course, to say something about Anna's um, work. But um, first, um, I want to say that to take pictures on the street, well, it's not as simple as most people think. We all have iPhones, what are you doing? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, even in, um, in the documentary, The Eye of Istanbul, uh, Anna complained that um, everybody is taking their pictures making snapshots on the street. But, um, and now there is nothing to photograph for him, maybe in another, in another world. Um, well, he was right. And at the same time, he was wrong. Uh, and I'm going to explain it. The theory of so-called decisive moment proclaimed by Garcia Brisson as what a photojournalist or street photographer uh, is supposed to capture is, in fact, in my opinion, a fiction uh, in Brahmin French uh, or a joke in English. Because if you see the decisive moment, it is already too late to photograph. <laughs> if you want to photograph it, well, you have to foresee it and to anticipate it. But how? <laughs> How can you foresee or anticipate something you don't know? Well, you can't. You just can't. It's impossible. 
what is possible um, is to have the situation or rather the idea of the situation already in your mind and to follow it inside yourself over and over and over again. And this is what differentiates a random snapshot taken on the street by passers-by from the work of the street photographer, a great street photographer, Azara Gurar. He was not, or not only, not only a taker of pictures, he was also an artist, a great creator. As an example, um, in Gurar's short story, The Convict, which was published when he was only 17 years old. And the story is about a man who is going to be executed on the guillotine. We have a perfect example of the, this decisive moment when the convict gives, before his execution, a piece of paper to the priest as his last wish, and which at the end we discover to be a written piece of music, a song. This is a perfect example of captured decisive moment. And it was perfectly written on the paper by Ara only because it was already in his mind and in his heart. Well, in fact, most probably many of his most successful images were already inside him before he took the shots. And as latent images that are already present on the exposed film, even if we can't see them yet, they are there. We need to develop the film in the developer, to develop the image within, the image inside himself, to let others to see it, to exteriorize it. Arbular had to encounter it on the street. Well, most well-known photographers are great not because they see something on the street and capture it immediately but because they are or were able to take a look to see inside themselves and capture those intimate images. Well, this is the, big, the biggest secret of street photographers. Well, and I'm happy to share it with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, after that, I'd like to make several comments on uh, our prepared photographs. Let's start. What a beautiful pictures. It's working. Well, let me guess how he was able to photograph. <laughs> um, he was possibly passing by by this street many, many, many times, if not thousands of encountering busy horses on this pedestrian traffic and uh, for him metaphorically even if he consciously didn't realize it it started representing the soul of this neighborhood and he was ready to take the pictures uh, he should have prepared his camera uh, setting up the exposure time and diaphragm uh, using light meter Staying partially hidden uh, by one of the street kills that is used here. Uh, and the probably making people think that he's choosing some closet of his dog to buy or something else, but following by his eyes the situation on the pavement, the mangas, the heavy charge, the two carriages. Uh, and when they were approaching enough, they started to make shots. Well, as a street photographer, I may tell you another secret that the first 15, 30 seconds, people just don't realize that you are taking pictures of them. Uh, especially if they are busy with uh, everything that is happening around with this heavy traffic on the street, uh, it's keeping their attention. That's why it was possible to make this very beautiful photograph uh, without notifying it by photographer's presence. And um, it's one of the best of him, I think. Let's take a look at these pictures. So, well, already 
um, a very familiar situation for our Guyana because uh, it was taken by Gofibal in his district of the city, the Yogo, if I pronounce it. A short note I would call this image, uh, where one can imagine the past and the future. This is the district where Ara was a part of. People probably have seen him many times, uh, probably used to him, used to his presence, and did not pay much close attention to what he was doing. But there is another thing. I'm sure the situation wasn't like that. Uh, wasn't as he probably wanted to be on the pictures when he was when he came there. So, uh, but he may have anticipated that something might happen. He was a man with a great patience. So, in my opinion, he was waiting for hours for a perfect shot, and he was waiting for this shot. And he took them on what was appropriate. But without this anticipation, he couldn't do it. Well, this photo in the district of Sheikh Zadeh Bashi. What I may say, uh, Norman Khan is a great poet uh, of the Eastern Museum Photography as a tool to express this po poetic vision. This shirt was probably taken, of course, in early morning, but uh, it was taken to translate his idea, to create a metaphor, to translate his feeling of just in general of the morning in Istanbul, uh, with light people on the narrow street, rough pavement, walls, etc. The size of the image square means that Aaron was using his first camera, which is a Rolex Core Type 2, which is a, it's a big camera with two lenses, and one half keep it on the chest and look down to the visa. So that's actually created a possibility because the camera was lower than his eyes to have this glimpse of sky and uh, create of this perfect vision of the sun that is coming from here that would be impossible without. Well, that's we are coming to something extraordinary. Um, in the book that was published and that John mentioned, well, we see image metaphor, a metaphor of the winter in Istanbul. And uh, in the book by, made by Nizih Tavlas, Arnold telling the story behind these pictures. Uh, he's telling that you know, there is a winter every year in Istanbul. It's coming, coming again and, and year after year. But there is no pictures representing the winter uh, of, uh, in Istanbul. And there, is, there was nothing to publish on the back of the magazine when they needed to have pictures of the winter in Istanbul. So he had to, again, to look inside of him and to probably find in his mind this image of horses and calotions because if you see on the hooks of the horses, you see kind of uh, sackcloth covering the hooves. Uh, Remembering and remembering as a symbol of the hardship of this uh, parallel world existing near the modern modern, uh, modern city, which represented by the tramway, probably pushing to find the image in on the line of the tramway number 26, which is in the uh, district called uh, and. Uh, of course, to have this perfect location of the horse and the town just behind, probably he had to either come many, many times or to wait long. 
And that this patient is one of the most beautiful part of Aragon Arcana. So, if you know, for me, um, in my opinion, this is most beautiful photographic masterpiece uh, made by Aragon Oh, of course. Well, so Aragon was a womanizer, at least of his youth. <laughs> So, um, yeah, he couldn't miss this shot. <laughs> but there is something more that I won't tell to you, and um, I will show you. There is a cut, there is a boy, um, there is a kind of absence of pavement. And um, apparent poverty of the neighborhood. Well, you may look at it as a kind of part of the art character, but you may also see that Anna just wanted to add a little bit of beauty and love by keeping these two women, chatting women, in the center of the frame. To, to, to add beauty in life as a metaphor to the smallest part of, part of the city. That's my idea. Yeah, before you change it, uh, this is one thing. You also notice that uh, uh, the weathered wooden buildings, this is so typical. This is 1957, yes. before there was a large uh, wholesale renovation. So many of these old wooden buildings have now been demolished, demolished. Uh, especially uh, along the waterfront, along the Bosphorus, or they were called Yalis, Y-A-L-I-S. And uh, uh, Gula, both in uh, the Istanbul or in comic book and in some of his own monographs, has incredible documentation of some of these Yalis. Yes. They, they really embody a, a spirit of, uh, of uh, the Turkish temperament, which Pamuk talks about, and excuse me, I don't mean to be presumptuous, I'm not Turkish, but, uh, but Hamuk uh, sees embodied almost in the weathered, weathered facades of these yalis, uh, a spirit, uh, a kind of spiritual spirit in Turkey that he calls Huzun. Huzun. Like sadness, which is a kind of sad, or a melancholy, but it's also uh, a kind of nostalgia. And uh, the, the, we talk about metaphors. The, you see some of it here too, as well. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no I'm just. <laughs> well, um, let's go to the next picture. Well, of course, as my photographer and myself too, um, Paragonar was attracted by twilight uh, in the city, which was a very beautiful part of the day. But, and he took this pictures of one of the most historic uh, districts of Istanbul, that is Zeyrek. And um, there is something that I want to tell you. He was definitely a, a brave person, a very brave person, having one of the most expensive cameras in the world. Later, to capture the soul of the old city, at the time where he was alone on the street, and waiting with bravery and passion and love, of course, they just ordinary people passing by. That's for me is amazing part of his car. Well, I I think John mentioned everybody about uh, he didn't mention anything to Ada was an actor. He was attending acting school. He was also passing all of his days when he was seven years old in the theater. Well, being an actor in acting school has its consequences. Ada was great in communicating with people. Um, but what these photographs show, his um, greatness, and talent was visible and appreciated even by kids. And the best example of this image 
in this image taken in 1987 when Ara was already senior, what I want to point it out is just every kid keep eye on Ara Gurian and everybody is happy. That's a symbol of himself, basically. That's why I have to choose it. So the last one. Look, Chris. Okay. Excuse me. All right. Uh, I'm going to preface my remarks with two disclaimers. Um, one of them is that I'm a newcomer to the work of Ari Gillard. Uh, in fact, the person who introduced me to this photographer's work um, is John Bailey, uh, who insisted that this was work uh, that I needed to be familiar with, and he was right. Uh, the second disclaimer uh, is that my Turkish pronunciation is atrocious, um, so forgive me in advance for what I can assure you will be an appalling uh, mispronunciation of every Turkish word that I say. I can only uh, assure you that I'm trying. Um, the work of Aragula gives us uh, an opportunity to reflect upon various aspects of photography. What it means to be a photographer, uh, how a photographer's legacy is built, how a photographer's work or the work of any artist uh, goes on to have a life of its own that is simultaneously independent um, of the photographer, uh, but of course can never be dissociated from the maker. This exhibition upstairs uh, presents Guler's photograph uh, to a new audience and will hopefully inspire people to dig more deeply into this rich body of work, uh, and it really is a rich body of work. Um, and I hope it will inspire people to find out more about this fascinating figure in the history of 20th century photography. Um, so, uh, again, as far as being a newcomer to uh, Guler's work, um, I really have taken a crash course and have come to appreciate it, but I'm not an expert, so I'm speaking about it from a very uh, myopic point of view. So nothing I say should be taken as gospel um, or very seriously. Um, but let me talk first about what kind of photographer I was. Uh, and of course, a photographer is never just one kind of photographer. A commercial photographer like you are, uh, has to be fluid and flexible to get the work that sustains him, um, while at the same time remaining true to his own aesthetic standards and his technical standards. Now, uh, Glare has a reputation of being the photographer of Istanbul, um, and he's known as the Eye of Istanbul, and indeed his photographs uh, of his hometown constitute a unique portrait of the city that is both highly personal to Glare, uh, but entirely universal at the same time. Um, we look at his images and we are invited in. Uh, there's nothing exclusionary in these pictures. Um, each picture offers us a scene we can almost walk into. The visual aspects of these pictures seem to bring along the sounds, the smells, and the feel of being on those streets. Uh, the photographs conjure up a sense of place that is quite distinct uh, even for someone like me, who has never set foot in Istanbul. So, uh, Uler is, that, uh, is part of that thin but very strong line of photographers who are firmly associated with a specific place, who, with their cameras, created a portrait of a place unlike any other. Now, that puts him in good company uh, within the history of the medium of photography. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures here uh, by people other than Aragula. Uh, these are, I'm going to show you three images by a French photographer named Eugène Couvelier, uh, who photographed in the forest of Fontainebleau in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, uh, and captured every tree, uh, every rock formation, um, and every little hamlet surrounding the forest of Fontainebleau. Um, and really, he created the portrait of Fontainebleau that surpasses, for me, um, who is a true believer in photography above all of the other arts, um, surpasses the work of the Barbizon painters. But that's just me and my subjective take on things. But this is a man who was of the place, um, in the same way that Gula was of his people. In America, in California, um, Carlton Watkins, um, 
made what still stands today as an indelible portrait of uh, Yosemite and what is now Yosemite National Park. Um, at the time, he fixed the idea of the landscape of Yosemite within the minds of his contemporaries, many of whom, of course, had never been to Yosemite. Now we come to Eugène Etche, another Frenchman, um, who created an astonishing uh, portrait of the city of Paris. Uh, this is a man who walked around Paris and photographed um, extensively in the late 19th century and into the 20th century. Um, and the portrait that he created um, of the streets of the parks, um, of the of every seemingly every shop front and shop window. Um, his photographic cataloging of Paris was encyclopedic, but artful. Working a few decades later, Brassai, a Hungarian photographer who had adopted Paris as his home, uh, started photographing Paris primarily, but not exclusively, at night. And he created his own portrait of Paris, which is very distinct from Atchez. Um, again, these are primarily nocturnal images. His, also, his images are also populated. Um, and uh, so they are populated nocturnal images as opposed to Atchez's uh, unpopulated diurnal images of Paris. Uh, Versailles was known as the Eye of Paris. Um, and there are probably a lot of French photographers who, um, who could also be called the Eye of Paris. He was one of the Eyes of Paris, a particularly talented one. Moving to Prague, um, this is a photograph by Joseph Sudek. Um, Joseph Sudek uh, was a photographer, lost an arm in World War I. Um, that did not stop him from walking around Prague in the decades uh, after um, World War I and up to and including World War II, uh, making images um, with this large format view camera. Um, he was known as the poet of Prague. And again, someone who is um, inex a photographer who is inextricably associated with his surroundings. This is work by Clarence John Moffin, uh, who is uh, an American photographer that uh, John and I were, we were talking beforehand, and we feel that he does not get as much attention as he deserves. Working in the city of New Orleans, um, he created this remarkable document of, uh, of the city um, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. There, it's a very different kind of approach to the city. Um, and ultimately, it's a very psychological portrait uh, of the city that I think had about as much to do as what was going on inside Laughlin's brain as what was in front of his camera. So they're interesting, slightly surreal images that uh, create this uh, you know, kind of very fitting portrait of New Orleans. And finally, we come back to New York City um, with Bernie Sadd. Um, who, working under the auspices of the federal government and the federal art project uh, in the 1930s, uh, produced a series of uh, many, many hundreds of images uh, under the heading Changing New York. Uh, and she caught the city. Um, she documented the old city giving way to the new city. Um, and. Um, this was, the 1930s was a time of uh, strife and also phenomenal change um, for New York City. Um, and she captured both the old and the new um, with a kind of wonderful sensitivity. Um, and it occurs to me to uh, remember O. Henry's quote about New York City was that New York City would be a nice place if they ever finish it. Um, and which is, which I still say whenever I walk under three blocks of scaffolding um, on my way to work. Um, so we come to Guler. Um, Guler's images too capture a city in a constant cycle of change. Um, and of 
course, all cities change, and that change is happening at uh, an increasing rate. Um, so at their base level, uh, Guler's pictures are an historical document of a city that no longer exists, or no longer exists as it once did. And that aspect of the work alone is exceedingly valuable. But of course, they are more than that. Um, they are perceptive, they are poetic, uh, and the drive to make them was a highly personal one. Um, whether they were stray shots he took uh, on assignment, or images that he stopped waiting patiently for all the subjects to line up perfectly. For me, it's this subjective quality of the images that makes them interesting to look at, and what keeps them interesting. These pictures stand up to repeated viewing, and one can go deeper and deeper into the pictures. And this is an interesting aspect uh, to photographers associated with a specific place. The, the place creates the photographer, and then the photographer creates the place. It's this wonderful kind of circular thing. In other words, the photographer is inspired by the place to photograph. And then the photographer creates a portrait of the place. And the pictures in the gallery upstairs demonstrate how Kugler uh, created his Istanbul. So whether we're talking about Ache or Abbott or Sudek, Versai, Watkins, or Kugelier, um, the photographs perform a bit of magic, if you will, by giving us a feeling of what it's like to walk down these city streets. Uh, we walk in with our shoes. Uh, more than that, they give us a chance to see the city through his eyes. Um, Guilherme's pictures do not fall into the trap of analysis or interpretation. The photographs manufacture their own meaning from their content. He's interested in the stones, the streets, and the people. And the success of Guler's images lies in their ability to set forth a rich and highly detailed account of the city, one that takes into account its contradictions and its conflicts, but one that is based, one that is based solely on the evidence of the pictures, affectionate without being sentimental. As I said, I'm a newcomer to Guler's work, um, and it's my hope that, the, uh, that this exhibition sparks more new interest and brings his work uh, the wider audience that it deserves. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, some of the work upstairs. It constitutes about a third of the exhibition space, but it's probably the least well known of uh, Ara's work uh, because, as you've seen, he's so uh, associated with the idea of the city of Istanbul, that the, the portraits, the celebrity portraits, that I'm going, some of which I'm going to talk about, uh, really represent um, a traveling photojournalist who is on assignment. As a matter of fact, Carol and I recently uh, just got a book in a series. Uh, you know, there are, there are a number of books called Italian Style, French Style. There's a whole series that came out in the last 20 years. There's one called Turkish Style, which I figured, well, would have some interesting photographs of interiors and decorations and, uh, you know, a little bit of architecture. Uh, and we got it because uh, some of the photographs were by Arna Gula. And when we got it, it was absolutely amazing because uh, most of the photographs are by him and they are most, the most amazingly beautiful colored photographs of details of furnishings and houses, of light coming in the windows. And it's so different from the other books in this in, in, in this category of style. Uh, if you have a chance to look at it, it's readily available. It's called Turkey Style. And it's absolutely phenomenal. And it's a window into another whole part of his work that we had not known before, and which you may not know the celebrity photographs so well. I certainly did. And I thought I knew his work. And then I come upon his work that was done on assignment. And I want to share a little bit of it with you right now. Uh, I wanted to talk about eight uh, photographs, I may not have time, but I at least want to talk about a couple of the more outrageous ones. And rather than try to just tell you the story, I'm actually going to read from the text, uh, which because the text in, in the book is so amazing, in the book Photojournalist, that almost transcribing it 
talking about the photographs here is just amazing. So the first one, and this is actually the most outrageous of all, so I thought I'd start with it, is the portrait that he took of Salvador Dali. <laughs> so let, let me just read this to you, because it, even if I don't talk about any others, this is so typical of the man and what he went, do, went through to get these photographs. He just didn't walk into a room with a camera and start shooting. So in 1971, Dolly is staying in the Maurice Hotel in Paris. Uh, when Guller enters his suite, he sees a silhouette rushing toward him, brandishing a cane. So you want to photograph me? I'm a very famous man. I want $25,000 for 10 minutes of shooting. Roy yeah. answers, I don't have that much cash with me. Anyway, 10 minute shooting is not my style. <laughs> Gula grabs him by the neck and belt and throws him out. It turns out that Dolly is the godfather of uh, Ara's girlfriend, Janesta. Another meeting is set, and Guler takes Janesta with him. It goes well until Guler admits he doesn't know Dolly had made a film. Dolly says, I made the greatest film in the world. There will be no greater film in world history. When the film is screened later that night, Ara realizes he recognizes the film as Louis Boonwell's A She and from 1929. Dolly was a quote screenwriter on the film. <laughs> so the photographer returns to Dolly's circus, this huge suite of wannabes and hangers on. And one day, he says, well, I was holding one of the cameras. Dolly went into another room and came back with a dueling sword from the Middle Ages. He waved the sword at me and started to duel. Gula convinces Dolly to stop jumping around and to pose like a matador. So pulling off a window drape, a piece of the cornice falls from the wall. Suddenly plasters everywhere. Gula shoots continuously as Dolly prances around, and he says, I can't remember how many objets d'art in the room were broken. Dolly and I had engaged in battle, so we could not think about details and the damage we had incurred. We both fell into chairs. I was both laughing and enjoying myself on the inside. And here's the point to the story. He says, I was happy because after so much coming and going, I had finally captured Dolly's atmosphere. So more than any of the hundred of other stories in the Tablas biography, this anecdote reveals to me Gula's mindset. Whether it requires spending days getting the most revealing photograph of a legendary crazy egomaniac, or waiting an hour for a cat to cross his frame in order to complete the composition of an Istanbul street scene, Ara the Perfectionist. Alfred Hitchcock. In May of 1974, Ara began an odyssey in the United States to photograph, as this shot said, to photograph and interview several dozen uh, creative Americans for a book. One of them was Hitchcock. Ara convinces the contrary director to loosen up and put his legs up on a table which is another one of the shots. It's sometimes shown it's not this shot. Hitch, at one point, opened a bottle of hidden whiskey because his wife did not allow him to drink. And he says, nobody can interfere with us now because we're working. Come on, let's have a couple of drinks. Ara says, we really cut loose after that. I imagine I took 200 photographs Hitchcock really knew how to add something special to a pose. He managed to add the element of fear. <laughs> One can only add that in consideration of Ara's acumen, it's all in a day's work. Okay, Sophia Loren. Here's the story of which Ara was most proud, and it takes a, a lot of space in the book to talk about it. He had covered the Cannes Film Festival over a dozen times. He went many years. When told by a colleague that Sophia Loren was at the Carlton, he follows Loren and her husband, Carlo Ponti, into the elevator, goes up to the ninth floor, and into their suite. They think 
he is with their party. And Lauren says, thank God we're all saved from the fracas. <laughs> so not wanting to stand out in a small group, Ara walks over to the Italian director, Alberto Latuada, engaging him about the success of Italian films in Turkey. <laughs> Ara says, Sophia Loren went into the bedroom and took off her shoes and sat on the bed comfortably. I immediately seized the opportunity and said, uh, let me take a few photographs of you. No one's ever seen you like this. Oh, go on, she said. When I sent the pictures, they had written the following text underneath the publicist in his newspaper. Our reporter in Sophia Loren's bedroom. <laughs> that was the head. And the, they printed posters out of it and hung it all over the streets. The sensational news was mine, but I didn't have a clue. And I was actually seeing some of the headlines. They were really scurrilous. They're like from the New York Post or something like that. And of course, this is a, one of the more beautiful, poetic photographs he took. There are actually several photographs of Lorraine on her bed with her shoes off. Um, let me move on to William Savoy, because this is one of the another of the famous uh, Americans. And, um, Tennessee Williams had told uh, Aura when he interviewed him, he said, you shouldn't be interviewing me, I'm just a playwright. Soroyan is really the guy, he writes the best dialogue and plays ever done. Well, maybe with the exception of Shakespeare. And so, um, he, uh, he's in Paris and he gets a phone call, he gets a phone number of Soroyan and he calls him. Soroyan gives him directions to his home uh, where the unshaven author reads it. Now, he'd been tracking Soroyan all over the place, all over America, all over Europe, and missed him in Istanbul, and they're both Armenian, so he really wanted to see him. Guler continues, there was practically no furniture in the house. Two wooden chairs, a folding table, a few dried up flower pots on the windowsills, books strewn all over the place. Later on, walking the streets of Paris, Ara understands that Soroy loves being with and talking to people, people from many walks of life. And they begin to you know, compare their Armenian childhoods. Ara is talking about his pharmacist's son, Dujat, who was hounded by you know, essentially anti-Armenian, I don't call them purges, but certainly a lot of trouble to cause in certain periods. And Soroy talks about his own father from Bitlis. So in the book, Creative Americans, Guler writes uh, and puts as a caption under this photograph of Savoy. Do you know the little people in your neighborhood? For example, if you're in Spain, do you know your neighbor, the small scale shoe shiner or the leather master on Rue Lafitte if you're in Paris, or the ice cream seller in Copenhagen? Even if you don't know them, William Soroyan knows them and their worlds as well. He was born in Fresno, but has become a man of the world. Observing the world through his perspective is superior to discovering the world for the second time. So Royan teaches us how important the smallest things are. Some caption, huh? You can only add, that could be a description of Ara himself and the way that he works in the world. The smallest of details. Uh, Nazim Hikmet. I feel a particular, very recent attraction to this photograph, and I'll tell you why. Over dinner last Saturday, when I mentioned I'm going to talk about the poet, Nazim Hikmet, Alexei, jokingly, I think, suggests Hikmet's not Turkish, he's Russian. <laughs> An indication of how revered this poet is in worldwide revolutionary circles. He mentions a 13-year sentence that Hikmet served in Bursa prison. And even after his amnesty release following the 1950 Turkish general election, no one in Turkey would publish his great prose poem, Human Landscapes for My Country. I'm reading it now, I find it very deeply moving, one of the great epics of ordinary lives lived in the chaos of the 20th century. And I brought the book, I'm almost finished with it. It's big. And I'm not usually somebody that reads epic prose poems, but I must tell you, this is the first English translation of it. It is one of the most amazing 
moving and engaging both that I've ever read. You think so, Chuck? Yeah. It's called Human Landscapes for My Country. So, let me see what else I can talk about. I, well, I tell you, uh, Pablo Picasso. The story of Grimm's pursuit of Picasso, and there's no other way to describe it uh, as anything other than a pursuit, because he actually did almost stalk some of these people for long periods of time. And so this story reads like a labyrinth of false turns and dead ends. The bartender at a bar near Picasso's home outside Cannes disabuses Ara of any appointment he may have made. He says, right in this room where you're sitting now, the ambassador of Russia in Paris waited exactly 12 days to give Picasso the highest medal in Russia, which is the Lenin Medal. Picasso had forgotten that the man was even waiting there. So, on arrival at Picasso's home, uh, he took the, paint, the, the publishers, the painter's publisher, Alberto Skiro, in tow. And Picasso instantly welcomes Art, and he says, Hello, Albert. Welcome. Go in and wait. I'll be back within an hour. I'm going to meet the man I fear most, my dentist. <laughs> so, returning a little later, Picasso leads Guller through a labyrinth of ever darker rooms, studio to studio, until he emerges in a very dark, sparse room. Seeing that Ara's beard is just starting to turn gray, Picasso says, Ah, but you really look like Cezanne. Wait, let me draw your picture. <laughs> Picasso finds a blank page in a nearby book and makes a drawing of Arna, dedicates it, and signs it. The book turns out to be a very rare edition of a Picasso monograph, and Arna carried it with him to the day he died. So his broad collection of this time with Picasso is the longest chapter in the Tablas biography. And he concludes, that section says, these four days open new horizons for me. It was like a magic wand, a magic flute. They're the most privileged days of my life. He enlightened me. Picasso changed my outlook on the world. The last person I'd like to talk to you about is a particularly moving portrait, and that's of the the, the poet and musician Ashik Yitzhak. Beautiful image. I've saved this portrait till the end. It's the most moving for several reasons. It's one of his most intimate, and there are reasons behind the look and the lighting of this portrait. Basil was a blind musician, a poet and artist of the people. Ara felt strong spiritual kinship with him. Watching YouTube videos of Basil, playing his long neck loop called the Badlama. Yeah. Seeing his folk stories, you're reminded of American folk singers like Woody Guthrie, or more to the point, the raw voice of bluesman Lionel and Jefferson. In late 1957, Buehler is shooting a film. He was a cinematographer, by the way, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. He was shooting his cultural documentary for French television, and he goes to visit Basil in his small village, Charkisha, in Sivas province, and he stayed for days shooting scenes of village life, including the harvesting of grain, a grain grinder turned by a blindfolded horse. He says, I took photos of many faces, working girls, men, an elderly woman, churning away. Subsequently, I found out they were all Vasily's grandchildren, children, <laughs> daughters-in-law, and the elderly lady churning was his wife. Thus, I photographed Vasily's whole extended family. So being a neophyte about Turkish folk culture and not knowing his work, I asked a young movie director and friend of mine, Cenkir Turk, if Vasil is a figure known to younger Turks. And this is what he emailed back to me. He says, Ashik Faisal is still very well known among Turkish youth as his songs are being covered by important rock bands and pop singers. His songs are very human, 
pure and simple, but cover a very big ex existential issues. For instance, the YouTube song you sent me is called. Sure, it was an interview you all day. Yeah, which means <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a long and narrow road, and it refers to life to live in itself. And Jen concludes, he says, the Turkish audience would love hearing his name in any talk you give. So I'm doing that. And uh, I have looked at several of his YouTube videos. They're very raw, they're photographed decades ago, black and white. They are amazing. I suggest you put his name up on YouTube and look at them. Uh, and, and so, you, and, you know, when you think of this thing of him appealing to youth, today's youth pop artists, you think of cover songs like, for instance, the Rolling Stones or Eric Clapton doing covers of Robert Johnson's songs from the 30s. So the next photograph. So this is the last thing I want to show you, and I'm afraid we're probably going to run out of time. We may have a little bit for some questions. So this is a photograph I took at the Guler Museum uh, when Carol and I were there several months ago, and it's in one of the vitrines. Uh, on the left, you see one of our as many Leica cameras. And of course, what also intrigued me as a cinematographer uh, was his Bolex 16 millimeter camera on the right and the photograph of our there. He was a filmmaker. He didn't do a lot of films, but when he was a young child, uh, and it, uh, it's discussed in his biography, uh, he uh, worked in, as a projectionist, uh, first a projectionist assistant, and then when he turned 13 as a projectionist in one of the uh, uh, movie theaters in his neighborhood. And I couldn't help but thinking of that, of those wonderful scenes in the film Cinema Paradiso, of the young boy in the projection booth that was our ruler as a teenager. So, you know, I think of him not as the way you say, uh, all just as way uh, Alexei made, you know, in terms of, you know, a colleague and a comrade, you know, with the still camera. But I think of him as a man who, maybe in another life, maybe if he hadn't been such a great artist with the still camera, he might have been a great cinematographer with more huge body of work. I think it would have been a shame because I cannot imagine him, even as a cinematographer, being greater than the work he did with his likeness. So I think that's it. Do we have, Frank, do we have any time for questions? If anybody has any? We have a few minutes. Yes or no? Yes. Yes? Yes. Either. So when Alexi was showing some of his photographies, uh, I noticed that in th three or four um, street shots, the main character, the biggest character, was turning his back to the camera. Is this something to read into? Is it a coincidence or it was an intention? I just want to get your opinion on that. Well, the fact when, when you are taking pictures of the street, uh, you don't want to change the situation, otherwise it will be a play. Uh, no other street photographs, not something that is a uh, part of the uh, local life. I mean, uh, the only way to do this, uh, you have to be somehow being visible. Uh, there is several things that you may have in mind, and uh, I guess uh, a regular huddle you, when you was using all of them. Um, it's just to approach the people from this side. If you have to, because as I have shown in the first image, you may just have um, be hidden in the kiosk that were on the sidewalk, and then um, take the pictures after that. So in the case of other pictures, somehow, somehow he have to be uh, not visible the first second because he, he didn't want to change anything there. That, that because he, he was feeling that if he will be introduced, something of the originality and authenticity would be lost. And um, as you mentioned, yes, on, on, not only on these three images, but on several others, 
Uh, some people are taken from the back. And that, by the way, there is nothing that image uses. The, image, the images are still great. And I, I actually do recall reading somewhere, very much to your point, that he, he has said that there are times he feels there's more mystery, there's more uh, kind of power in a way by sometimes not seeing the face and reading the character by the way they stand. Yes, the way this tools, yes. The frame. And there are many photographers that do that. Because if you frame. don't see the face, you may imagine it. If you do see the face, there is no imagination working. You know, the great, our, our great American, Swiss American photographer, Robert Frank, who just died you know, a, a few weeks ago. If you look at the work, say, in the Americans, tremendous number of those photographs are faces that are cut off, faces that are in shadow, people in the back, profile, a lot of them. And they're very powerful. Sometimes it's straight on, you know, rendering of a face. It's, it's maybe sometimes maybe too explicit. Just a thought. Anybody else? Let's have more questions. Anybody? One more? Nobody? Sold. Thank you, everybody, for coming.